Right, that is where things can get very interesting. I mean, we've heard rumblings in the other regions with those fancy folk who like to uh, throw away the quest if they have certain builds of the deck. I think it was mainly the Gadgets and Auctioneer list that allowed you uh, to throw away the quest because you're just trying to chain, burn, redraw all your ignites and kill your opponent that way. Uh, in this matchup, I do believe you are still mostly reliant on the quest, uh, but you raise a fantastic point, absolutely, that there is enough burn in the deck to quite handsomely kill your opponent without having to worry about ever playing Dawngrasp. That is probably more consistently achieved if you are running a Pexis Blast, though, of which neither True, yeah. player is. And so, even though it takes a lot of meandering to actually get the quest done and turns where you're not pinging them in the face, you kind of uh, get your return on investment by the time Dawngrass comes online, not just because you get the plus spell damage, but because your card draw becomes that much easier to achieve. The cram session, getting you to the bottom of your deck, making sure you see multiple ignites. And in order to get the quest done as quickly as possible, we do know that we need Encanter's Flow, which both players have at uh, the earliest possible juncture, which means that it's going to be at least a fair fight here, Derek. It is indeed coin flow into flow. Both players as well, interestingly enough, with uh, a minion in hand, either be it the One Thief or the Primordial Studies, which can often be a big deal because, of course, the uh, the unspoken underpinning of this matchup is that it's very difficult to complete your quest when there are no minions ever played. Your opponent will very rarely play a minion and not instantly kill it with their own spells. Uh, but with double Primordial Studies now available for Tiz, as soon as he finds uh, First Flame or Brain Freeze, you can actually start moving through his quest with some relative haste. He, he still needs some other good spells, and so we might even end up seeing one Primordial Studies used to activate a cram session for an extra card draw. Uh, but overall, this is the kind of hand for both players that can get there relatively quickly. That's true. Tis just missing the fire school, like you said. There's the first flame, and so we could see whatever minion comes off of the primordial studies immediately shot away. Because Tis did keep that ice barrier, which I think is absolutely a good keep for the mirror, just because it's so hard to get the frost spells in particular yeah. to target anything. Possessy he did pick up an ice barrier of his own, and the Blood Mage Thalnos pick for Tis is perfect because it allows him to keep cycling as well. Flurry picked up, probably not going to see any targets for a long time, but that's okay. He's just going to keep drawing through and hopefully for him find a way to get another Frost Spell because in this matchup, Ice Barriers just never go off. So even yeah. if you get the second one, you're not really guaranteed to be able to play another Frost Spell. Well, speaking of cycling, one thing I was kind of interested in there was actually just playing the cram session. Uh, I know it's good post uh, Varden in order to draw a bunch of cards, uh, but was there not any consideration to play it there with the two mana you had available just to, again, turbo cycle through your deck to guarantee yourself quest completion? I mean... It's worth thinking about, but it's in no way a guarantee, right? It's the frost spells that are still a problem here. And in terms of getting um, the activation on the frost spell, he was really only missing brain freeze uh, because he would have that second minion as a target from the primordial studies. So uh, I don't fault Tiz for waiting a little bit longer here, especially since he has another chance on cram session with that spec second spell damage minion. Although it looks okay. like he's not going to go for it anymore because he has uh, snap freeze to use on it instead. Yeah, it's a pretty big deal, huh? You can start chewing through his quest actually pretty quickly now, huh? Possessy, no slouch either. Done with quest stage one as well. Brain Freeze picked up for Tiz. So can he do the overlap on one minion, two frost spells played? Yeah, he locks frost and fire, so you start with the fireball face. You can go snap freeze first and then brain freeze afterward, which means he only needs a target for the second flame and then one more arcane spell. And then that's Dawngrass in hand. Damn, very, very quick completion Whoa, of the tears. And a second cram. This is just incredibly fast. As soon as he finds, as we were saying, that minion to play on the second flame, we're laughing. He's already there. For Possessi, though, on the other side, it's that awkward dynamic you were talking about with the ice barrier. He can't replay it, which... Does that ever incentivize him to go for that cram session I was talking about? His turn is kind of dead here if he doesn't find a frost spell to play. He might uh, might be start with one thief and hope it gives you something like brain freeze or snap. Ooh, yeah. 
if you miss, he could still ignite it just to get it off the board. Although there's really not that much incentive for trying to stay off the board entirely because Tiz has already played all the frost spells he needs, right? True. Uh, I guess there's still second flame to think about, which Possessi knows is in hand, so he could try and strand that in Tiz's hand. I guess by that metric, then, you're allowed to leave Mini Mage on the board because generally, even with stealth, you have to clear it off because Flurry can still uh, hit it, even if it doesn't target it. But as you said, because all the Frost spells are played, I think this is good recognition from Possessi that this is specifically the kind of minion you are actually allowed to play. Right. Oh, Ignite, perfect for Tiz here. Actually, the perfect absolute oh best cards would have been Hot Streak uh, so that he could Hot True. Streak play Varden immediately, but this is good enough. You take the Ignite, send it face, next turn, Dawn Grasp. Um, there is a little bit of consideration as to whether he should flurry this mini mage, but I really don't see it because even though mm. it will get three attack face at some point, Tiz has eight points of armor yeah. from the ice barrier. So if you think this mini mage is going to attack three times, then you can think about freezing it, but it's never going to be able to attack that many times. Yeah, completely agree. It doesn't even deal with the spell damage, so you're just saving that. Um, Cram hmm. for one. What was he looking for? Runs out on me. I don't know. Hot Streak didn't do it, right? Uh, oh. Looking for a way to kill off the mini mage? That doesn't ever work. Yeah, uh, I mean, hmm. maybe Fire Sail at three mana, exactly. He had three mana left this turn. It would have killed mini mage and finished the quest, but if it's I just guess. a specific card, I don't know if it's worth using a precious cram session for, mm -hmm. although I guess he has this other one, so his resources are still fine. The bread baker coming into hand for Possessi, that could come in clutch a little bit later because these mage battles sometimes come down to just being one or two points of burst off, and you kind of assume damage permanent, so you put the other mage to two, have your fireball in hand, but what if they heal back up? Okay, that is a frost spell in Cone of Cold, so you can go, huh? uh, I guess, well, you could clear your board if you wanted to, but that 3 one's probably pretty good, so you could go Thalnos and then destroy the Wand Thief and the Thalnos, um, mm -hmm. I suppose, just to kind of do a li as little damage to your board as possible. Yeah, I like that. The permanent spell damage, essentially, you get off of the Mini Mage is quite useful indeed. Mm. I mean... Apologies, unless, of course, you want to just start launching stuff at face. That is also a consideration at this point with two spell damage on the board. Uh, this is quite a lot of damage he can get through, and sensing that he's behind on quest completion, he's just going for the full-on burn plan. True. It's just not going to bother trying to get the Varden. He does have this Ignite in hand for what's probably going to be three damage, because we could see this mm. Thalnos get wiped off, uh, which means Possessi is looking for another Fireball, draw the Ignites back, or even a Timely Discover to get it done. Um, kind of makes me wonder whether the pick was supposed to be Cone of Cold if he's just not going to bother with Quest, though. Maybe Arcane, uh, maybe Counterspell would have given him a bit more utility then. Yeah, that's fair. It's not like it's going to be used to freeze the Varden with a uh, a flurry in hand. And as for Possessi's natural burn left, it's really just the ruined orbs at this point. He's used mm. the fireballs already, but I think he's still on quest 2, which means that he'll get a discover off this brain freeze. And if that's a fireball or an ignite, then we're talking. Ruined orb, you take that. That's three extra damage. He's now... Five of lethal, right? If this is a base ignite. Yeah, I think so. Which means just a couple ignites and pings away. But does he have the time? Oh man, Looks it's like he's gonna just be gonna close. get the Varden of his own. Which means that next turn he has ignite ping for lethal. Oh wait, does he have it now? Is it's, it's a, a level base ignite, right? I think. I think so. So I think it's just one damage off. Uh huh. But it's fine to go for it. I mean, just set up for the ping next turn. You can trade. You've only played one, uh, uh, sorry, one flow, so it never actually gives you lethal. True. <sighs> yeah, okay. and I guess he has flurry to play around any potential disruption from Tiz, like a generated counter spell. So it's no worries to go for. Oh, I thought he was just gonna hold the ignite for next turn, but it only costs zero this turn because of the hot streak. So he doesn't actually have guaranteed lethal next turn. No, he did. He he pinged, and he could have gone Varden 
ping. But no baby. Ignite bear. next turn. Oh yeah. Unless yeah. his three one was cleared off, then it would have been six plus one, seven. So then it would yeah. it could have been one off. It, it was very very complicated actually. Indeed, but for Tiz, obviously no time to wait here. He feels yeah. like and is almost certainly dead next turn, so he's going in with the second flow. Here's the spring water. There still ignites in the deck. Fireball in the hand. Hot streak makes the fireball oh. cost one. A little bit off lethal. It's 15 damage. Yeah. You can go digging with one thief or trade with fire, sa uh, fire oh, no. sale. I guess you start with ignite. ignite first. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like that. Oh, man. He's running out of time. Got to go. He's got to hit it on this card. Fire sale oh, again. No. One he more now trade. doesn't have mana. He has hot streak, though. Uh, but zero no, mana. Oh, it's oh. Zero mana. It does cost zero. That's the one that came uh, before the flow. Oh, I mean, after the flow was played, but right. the second one was shuffled in the deck. It had to be that ignite in particular. Oh my god. That gosh. is the game to tis. That was disgusting. Specifically, that one card uh, to give him lethal. I mean, maybe it could have been a rune orb as well. Uh, I guess to uh, uh, hot streak the fireball instead. But man. Well played by both players. Uh, uh, obviously, it was the much more standard game plan from Tiz. He understood perfectly how to clear your minions off the board, progress your quest as quickly as possible. Uh, but from Possessive, with a very, very complicated last couple of turns there, he explored exactly what you were talking about, the alternate win conditions that don't necessarily involve Dawngrasp. Yeah, um, he was sort of meandering, I would say, in the middle between quests and just a lot of spells um, shot to the face here again. If he was not going to rely on Don Grasp, I do question the Cone of Cold pick. Uh, right. Because we did see he only did end up getting Don Grasp because there was a Brain Freeze target on the other side, at, at which point he would have been able to play Flurry as well. Uh, this Cone of Cold could have potentially be, been a counter spell. So I guess the Mage Mirror, you really do have to be decisive on what game plan you go for. Because I see the pause after he got Dawn Grasp, I think he might have thought it was an upgraded Ignite that he had in hand, except it was a base level Ignite, so he was actually one off from killing right there, and instead decided to go for the Spice Bread Baker. I also don't know if that was the ideal order for the Baker heal. Gonna have to go back and look at that. Uh, but it was just a hair's breadth away from him taking the game on the next turn. Well, here it is. For Possessi, the mage out of the way for his opponent. So switching over to the handlock does seem a much a uh, relatively safer proposition, I will say. Uh, for Tiz, there's still the uh, the druid and the demon hunter, uh, which I'm going to say does probably leave Tiz with two pretty good matchups. The druid, uh, as I think you discovered in testing the other day, uh, is just very, very susceptible to all the uh, all the big threats, all the mana cheat that you have available uh, as the warlock post-celestial uh, alignment. And the demon hunter, uh, while I think a little bit more interesting of a matchup with a bit more counterplay, on average, I find that the uh, OTK Demon Hunter struggles to hit quite enough removal whilst also keeping their combo intact against all those big minions. That's true. The fact that Tiz is bringing OTK Demon Hunter at all is maybe not the most in vogue deck for APAC because mm. we do know these three um, earliest Japanese GMs are bringing the Brute Demon Hunter instead, but we do know Okashinsuke and even Surrender were rocking the OTK Demon Hunter, so it really is differences in schools of thought and also what fits better with the lineup, because I think the quest OTK Demon Hunter does make more sense with a, uh, a combo-oriented lineup. It's got, I would think, a more consistent matchup versus Shaman, uh, but Again, some brute enthusiasts would disagree with me there. Some would say it's even strictly better <laughs> than in Frozen Hearthstone, as you said. Um, but against Handlock, no. I do think it takes a little bit too long to get online. Like, yes, OTK Demon Hunter has tons of removal, but it's more well-placed versus a wide board of small minions, whereas the Handlock loves to go for a narrow board of very strong, high-health minions. So even things like Morg I-Beam is not enough to get past a Flesh Giant. Great analysis, Gia, but I'm afraid it's all useless because Possessi is once again transitioning to the Astral Plane and <laughs> therefore will be unbeatable for the next game of Hearthstone. It's just how it works. I'm sorry. <laughs> if your camera is unfocused, you just win all the time. How come you haven't been winning, Dark?
How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> I miss casting with Raven. <laughs> I miss casting with Raven. Uh, either way. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I, I had the, the caster's curse this morning of... Uh, uh, playing before broadcast, losing four games in a row, and thinking, oh, it's eight minutes till broadcast. Go on, I can fit one win in. Uh, yeah. but, uh, I decided against it because I think I would have brought a very bad energy to the casting desk had I lost another one. Uh, but either way, starting things off here, uh, Tiz has got himself not the best starting hand, but with that pick of a sigil of alacrity, uh, level one of quest becomes a lot more easy to complete. Whereas on the other side, Possessi is getting a very, very quick hand. Uh, this is a lot of pressure that he can put down with tap a nether on tour guide on this turn. Uh, Null plus uh, the neophyte if he wants to. So many different ways to push up the pressure and disrupt his opponent. Netheron is super tempting this turn, and honestly, I felt like I would have ended up on it, but the mm. Neophyte going into a Sigil turn is so backbreaking against Demon Hunter. You kind of assume that they needed that Sigil to get the quest done, so they need to play one to two other cards to get the rest of it done. Uh, but nice. as it happens for Tiz here, he had both this top deck Spectral Sight and the Acrobatics in order to make sure that the quest is not delayed by a further turn. So, Possessi... I mean, he does, does still get eight points worth of pressure on board. So that's just one less than another on with the tour guide. But it means that another on is a little bit farther away from actually costing one because he's only going to be able to tap up to nine cards next turn. Maybe it's going to be backfire instead then. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what specifically makes me okay with this play from Possessi because leaving another on dead in hand in this matchup is not something that I'm interested in at all. Uh, but with this line, it does over-complete the quest somewhat, but against a deck like this, I really don't think that's your biggest concern. He has uh, now double touch of the Nathras, him drain soul. Uh, he's going to have plenty of healing. That's not his concern at all. As uh, already, not only does he have this very impressive board, He's at 14 cards left in deck on turn 5. He's going to be playing these Scavengers in just two turns' time. However, the hand space to keep tapping becomes kind of an issue because he does not really want to soul rend his own board and sure. make his life easier. But we'll see. I just want to also note that Possessi, who in last seat, oh my gosh, this glide. Ooh. Is that worth it? He has zero cost fell scream in hand. I mean, I don't think he can get away with it. There's too much threat on board. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. It's just a little bit too scary. You've got to clear this turn. So it's the Arcanist Immolation Aura. I was going to say, Possessi last season in his winner's interview um, over in the Japan Celebratory stream said mm. that he was aware of the possibility of Kurtris being discovered by OTK Demon Hunter on the other side. And so he played around a discoverable Kurtris in terms of positioning. Just now he played around Felscreen Blast positioning also by positioning his biggest threats on the farthest edges of his board. And I like to see that little micro-optimization from Possessia. I expect no less. Telling you, the less the camera focuses, the more he does. He's sapping its energy to uh, play a higher level of Hearthstone. Uh, the glide coming in, though, is very annoying, obviously, for Possessi on the, the first hand because he has like six cards less uh, less in hand next turn. Uh, but also because that, that point I was talking about where you're able to get down the Baron Scavengers is so much further away now. Oh. Um, however, he has just somehow picked up a better hand than he had oh. with like 10 cards in hand. This is now r ridiculously powerful with tap to complete the quest, Flesh Giant available for two mana alongside uh, the Cult Neophyte as well. The disruption, the the threats, oh it's so much. I was gonna say, pretty lucky for Tiz to pick up a cheap card so that he was able to outcast the glide still a turn after. <laughs> but not if you're gonna give Possessi a better hand. It was straight yeah. up just better. Like the Baron Scavengers last turn were a liability because he couldn't get down to enough cards in hand to really, uh, in deck to really make them efficient. But now the Flash Giant coming down for so cheap. Tiz, with no great answer to the board, only has effectively two points AoE and no guaranteed way to get to the Arcanist. But, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, the Guild Trader makes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's pretty cute. Forgetting you can play that card. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just one mana shuffle this card into my deck. Uh, which is pretty cute. You know, it, it's, again, that 
problem I was talking about, though, with the OTK Demon Hunter, where they have these powerful board clears, they can deal with a lot of what the Warlock is throwing down. But now what? Moag, Felscreen Blast, Arcanist, Guild Trader, all these powerful combo pieces are just being littered onto the board. And uh, there's not really any kind of a realistic win condition that I'm seeing for Tiz at the moment. And that means Possessi is meant to double down on the threats, but what is the best way to go about it? I really don't like the idea of leaving a Moarg on board, even if it means you get another on online. I was honestly thinking about what Solren does, especially if you fit in the tour guide there, which would delete three cards from the deck, which means at the next draw, he gets to that 10 point mark. But I guess it's not so important given that he's already played one Baron Scavenger. I think the more important thing for Possessi is getting to raise dead as soon as possible. But with this acrobatics pickup that is guaranteed Guaranteed Kurtris in hand for Tiz this turn. Wow, okay, this is a lot of card draw. Uh, I love the ordering as well, obviously, to draw Peddler first so that you um, uh, guarantee yourself, or make it less likely to draw a card you can't play off the acrobatics. Uh, and then, as you said, Kurtris next turn, plenty of uh, card draw coming in, so his deck's looking pretty thin now. Honestly, I think Tiz had the temptation of just going for the double jump instead of the I-beam Crimson Sigil Runner so he could play Kurtis immediately. Oh, but the problem with right. that is that you sometimes strand the Sigil Runner in hand, right? And you don't actually have any more guaranteed card draw. Uh, it gets stranded because the Ilganoth is far left by this point. So I think it's still right for Tiz to delay the Kurtis on board for a little bit just to make sure that he can consistently have enough card draw to actually see the combo mm. and make sure that um, those cards he would have drawn are actually drawing cards instead of stuck in the middle. Once again, though, here for Possessi, is at that point I was talking about where because of the glide, a Netheron, Knoll, uh, Scavenger, all these cards are actually pretty expensive. He has to pay full, uh, full mana cost for all of them. Uh, which is okay, you know, it's still a pretty threatening board uh, that he's got down here. But it's starting to slow down now. Tiz is getting ahead uh, in the matchup. He may be able to clear the board and get ahead here this turn or next turn. The question is, does he have the uh, the gas to keep going? Does he have his win condition able to go uh, with Ilganoth still in hand for full mana? I mean, he absolutely does. The Morg and the Talented Arcanist are still in the deck, right? Which means that he's really only going to need to pay for Felscreen Blast and Ilganoth mm. as part of the combo. I guess there's still a philosophy yeah, lacking to get the Crisp 36, but the 18 is very much alive. And there's also just an I-Beam. Uh, so it then becomes a 24 guarantee, which could be padded by Discoverers and um, whatever comes off of the Illidari studies, I mean. Possessi just again. I, I <laughs> there's there's one thing I overestimate and one thing I underestimate about Demon Hunter. I always underestimate the impact of Glide uh, on the Warlock. It just turns a great looking situation to a pretty disastrous one. And then I often uh, overestimate or again underestimate uh, how much burst potential they have. Like how many combo pieces they have. I always think after they throw a couple down, uh, they're not able to go for it. But as you correctly pointed out. Still uh, very happily 18 and possibly 24 coming down in the next couple turns. Uh, it may need to be the full 30 or at least like 28 to be able to get there against Possessi because he's healing up very rapidly now. Right, so he needs a great studies outcome. None of these are damaged. They're not even board clear. They're all useless, honestly, at this point. I guess yeah. he could Stelina to put back the Battlemaster, but there's already nearly lethal showing on board right now. It's not safe. Okay, there is left in the deck one more Illidari studies and the persistent peddler. The double jump draws nothing. So if he wants to get to the full 30, he needs the other studies. To hit I beam? I beam or yeah, Chaos Leech might even do it at this point. I don't think there's mana then, right? Because you, uh, you could deal 29 then by not playing the I beam and doubling up on the. Uh, the five damage from Chaos Leech up to ten, I think. I think it works. The Chaos Leech will cost two, and then you oh, get sorry, the beam yeah. done afterwards, so it costs one. I guess you still need like targets for that to happen. Right. Targets on the other side because the I beam has to happen after the Fell Scream Blast. Uh, but it's definitely not there yet, right? So Tiz is just gonna yep. go for the board clear here. It means he gives up on the Arcanist. So. 
a study is the biggest one aside from IBM is actually philosophy that we forgot to mention. Uh, but without the Arcanist, it's getting tougher and tougher. Oh, this is a pretty sick draw, though. You can now go. Uh, Tamsin plus the piggy, you're up to 26. There's 20. 30. Yeah. Okay, if he hits Philosophy, it's like 12 plus 12. It's still just 24 plus the Stelina hit face, and that's not even a Philosophy, not a Chaos Leech. But he can get ahead on board. He can tempo Ilganoth. <laughs> oh, is that really how we're winning this with tempo Ilganoth down at the There's end? There's no other way. There's no yeah. other way. <laughs> He's just out of combo pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, so how much can you deal on the same turn here. He can't play Kurtris plus all the other cards, unfortunately. He's one mana off. Yeah, I think he might just end up with Ilganoth trade, hope the Ilganoth sticks, and then it deals Man. eight next turn. But we see in Possessi's hand, the answer is there. Tamsin for the double Shadow Blast to get rid of Ilganoth without any lifesteal damage at all. And I think that will seal out the game. Man, what a close one. You always have to think here as Tiz, was there any way I could save one more combo piece? He just needed the tiniest little bit extra uh, to be able to get over the finish line. Uh, but the border, as you said, not going to be enough for now. He throws it down, equalized at one game apiece, and a pretty big win coming through here for Possessi. Uh, I guess with the Mage out of the way, the worst matchup for the Handlock was already done. Uh, but against the full combo lineup, Handlock can struggle. And uh, overall, it was piloted very well from Possessi to get maximum pressure online every turn and forced his to have those answers, which in the end, he had the answers, but that turned out to be his uh, undoing when he just had, uh, he used one too many to survive. It was just such a close game the way this panned out. I usually feel like this more often happens like that first turn from Possessi where the board comes online and then the D100 doesn't actually have the answer and then they die. Tiz got all the way to the very last hurdle, just needed to survive that last board, but he couldn't do so without breaking apart his combo. And then the Ilganoth, the very last resort, hope it survives, but he conceded upon seeing the Tamsin, already knew there was no hope for that. It was really, really close and with some better decisions Discovers, I don't think it would be a long shot for Tiz to actually take that yep. game. Say that Stelina was a philosophy instead of, a, well, a Stelina. Maybe there would have been enough damage there. Uh, but very well piloted from Possessi. I think Tiz gave it, the, gave it the best shot he could as well. And that means Possessi will be moving on to his own Demon Hunter, which is of a very different variant. It is, yeah. I've had enough thinking about my Demon Hunter plays. I just want to get <laughs> brooted now uh, as Possessi is going to be switching over to that. Uh, against the Druid on the other side, as again, you know, this is very standard Brute Demon Hunter. You know what it does. It tries to just cheat out Brutes on turns uh, three through five, like just to get them down as cheesily and quickly as possible. Uh, and then, of course, the Lion's Frenzy to close things out. But again, for the Druid, it, it's that same rough situation as against uh, the Handlock a lot of the time, where their opponent has these big minions that cost zero post uh, Celestial Alignment, which makes the overall game plan for the Druid a lot more difficult to try and pass through because you can just go for turbo out the Celestial Alignment and hope that your hand is good enough to beat theirs. But I think you sometimes with this matchup have to consider the alternate route of just ramping into powerful stuff, going with ramp into Solar Plus Scenarion, playing Malagos, playing Best in Shell. Uh, because again, this Brute Demon Hunter that has essentially zero removal uh, can struggle against your big threats if you don't give them the option to play zero mana brutes after alignment. True. I will say this version of the deck, uh, the Celestial Druid with the Cthulhu in there and the Auctioneer, we haven't actually seen it on stream in APAC all weekend yet. Um, there was a different version with just Anaconda, and that's a matchup where if you're teching in the alignment, then yes, I absolutely endorse holding on to the alignment because you need to have the perfect hand, which is tailored to your deck to actually justify it. Um, mm -hmm. And Much it's often answerful. just in there to maybe lock out mages, etc. With this deck, 
there's a lot more reason for playing alignment. Um, mm-hmm. You, of course, still need to have the anaconda or at least an auctioneer nourish to justify um, alignment as early as possible. And we see Tiz keeping it because that is his main win condition. Uh, but he has to be ready, right? If you play an alignment, there could be a maximum, what, three brutes coming down in a single turn, maybe four if they've used one philosophy already. And uh, that stuff gets very, very scary. Uh, but if you do manage that first threat check and you get the alignment down safely, it can still be very powerful in the matchup because you are um, not allowing the Demon Hunter to play Kerchus as long as the alignment happens before their quest is completed. Yeah, very. I think you're absolutely spot on. It's it's essentially just praying that your opponent doesn't have the good cards uh, to go yeah. alongside it uh, after you do go with the alignment. Uh, I think the real question here, though, for Tiz... Um, because obviously this is an alignment hand. You kept it in the mulligan. You're going to get it out uh, as quick as you can. But I guess maybe as quick as you can isn't necessarily the right way to say it. Because should you go for it as quick as humanly possible? Is this Bloom coin alignment on four overloading yourself for a turn and giving them a full two turns before you can respond? It could be. I think it'll largely depend on what happens with this Fungal Fortunes for Tiz. If mm. he picks up Overgrowth, then you'd love to play that and then naturally alignment so that you don't have to skip the turn after. Uh, but there is a lot of merit to just turboing out alignment as well because he has Malagos in hand. Um, so he has at least the turn after the Overload unlocks a full guarantee of draws onto the board. But um, it means that Tiz has to be prepared for the worst case scenario of three brutes hitting the board if he sees a philosophy that is um, more likely two yeah. for him. And that's actually, you know, not game-ending pressure. Like, you can skip a turn to that and not immediately be dead, but it is risky. It is risky. And I mean, the other uh, kind of unspoken f uh, facet of this matchup that... Uh well, unspoken, so we haven't mentioned it yet. Uh, it's the fact that you do have to get moving pretty quickly as the Druid, because if you're too slow and you don't go with the Celestial Alignment because you're afraid of being overloaded, they can just complete the quest. If they have Kurtris in hand and you then go Celestial Alignment, their entire deck costs zero and you will die on the following turn. Yeah. I would love to see that APM check for Possessi, especially oh. since he was waiting a little bit uh, on the Garot Rogue. But look at this now, double Brutes in hand, Spectral Sight. These are going down to zero, Derek. They are. Double Jump gives the chance for Philosophy here as well, which we're obviously uh, very greedily looking for now. This is so weird. One brute costing zero and one costing one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't usually see asymmetry, but he gets the philosophy. It's three brutes. Oh, Tiz knows there's at least two, but when he sees the third one coming down, this is not a board you can go alignment into because it is game-ending pressure over two turns. Oh, man. I love it when brute players put the brutes on either side of the Crimson Sigil run. It just makes it feel like it's like their bodyguard, like they're protecting yeah. their, their tiny friend. Uh, but yes, uh, essentially... Go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's, he's, he needs uh, some protection. Uh, but while he does have... Ooh, actually a fairly powerful turn with Solar Heart, maybe with a Lunar Eclipse thrown in there as well, it's actually still only clearing off one brute. It is, and it means that he'll have three mana to work with next Yeah. Week. He'll need to top deck the other Lunar Eclipse to clear the other one. I mean, I don't see any better options, so hmm. I, I like where your head's at. It's Coin, Lightning Bloom, Lunar Eclipse, a 7-8, and then you go yeah. Solar Heart. It all fits, but it means there's 13 damage coming back the other way, minimum. And so what's the out next turn uh, if you go for that line? Find the other Lunar Eclipse and hope there's, there's no other pressure that turn. I don't know. I guess, yeah. I mean, you could go Fungal into, like, uh, Bloom, Lunar, and maybe a Feral, uh, feral Rage um, in order to be able to gain the armor to survive. Like, it's a very flimsy game plan, but the main game plan of going Coin, Bloom, Celestial literally just loses the game on the spot. You have already lost. Uh, so I, I agree that this is pretty much the only chance he's got. The other line, I suppose, was just Fungal and Hold there. You tank the uh, 21 damage. I don't think he's ever dead that turn. He could get very, very close and 
but uh, maybe you pick up Scenarian Ward off of the Fungal and another Lightning Bloom, and then you can go for the Solar, Solar, the Solar Scenarian Ward. I don't even yeah. think that's good enough. Everything loses. He got brooded. I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't go Lunar Eclipse there as well, to be honest, just to take seven less damage uh, on this turn. If you're ever going to have an out, it comes through that, I think. Uh, I but yeah, there we go. The Brute Demon Hunter I doing what it does. Two games to one to Possessy. <laughs> doing what it does. Mm-hmm. And Possessy, camera back in focus. He has That's what I'm telling from you. the Astral Plane because he he's already gotten the Brutes. Yeah, he doesn't have to focus, so his camera goes back in focus. It's a, it's a give and take between him and his lens. Once it's Brute Demon Hunter, crystal clear, 4K Posan. But once it's uh, a high uh, it's skill intensity deck, I will say, that requires a little bit more brain power, then he's uh, blurry as you like. Yep, just taking another turn to admire the beauty <laughs> of the Triple Brute. Mm. Um, is certainly going to be haunted by that one, but we've all been there. It's all happened to us on ladder, turn four, turn three even sometimes, with the triple brutes coming online. Yep. That just is how the deck functions sometimes. Uh, Tiz is going to have to get his head back in the game and try to win two games against Possessi's last remaining deck, which is not Rogue that got banned away. It's the Mage. Mage. Yeah, uh, which I do, I do think gives him a pretty good matchup to start things off with, with the Druid. You know, it's a deck that has a lot of armor gain, an awful lot of quest disruption. It's, you know, it's almost the deck that you bring Druid to be. Everything it does counteracts everything that Mage is trying to do, because it doesn't even play any minions at the start of the game, which Mage really wants you to do to, as well. Um, but then when we get to the Demon Hunter against Mage, assuming that Tiz wins here, uh, that can get a little bit more complicated. Uh, generally, the Druid is able to get the alignment online before Possessi's anywhere near finishing the quest, which is a big deal because it gives his so much time, like the mana needs to naturally get back to five for Possessi for uh, Dawngrass to even get played, which in the meantime, he has to first complete the quest and Tiz might even draw his second alignment, if not just straight up kill Possessi. The hand is starting to come together for Tiz. Fungal Fortunes is huge, especially since mm. he already has Anaconda in hand, but this is not the pure Anaconda version. There's still a lot of big misses on Fungal Fortune. Uh, the Malagos, the Gadgets and Auctioneers are pretty important to really make sure that post-alignment, you can actually kill the mage. Possessi's hand is reasonable enough for the matchup, though. Short of the, the dream card in Encanter's Flow, of course, he has the ability to, uh, you know, keep cycling through his quest, target his Thalnos here with a Blood Mage, uh, sorry, with a, a First Flame this turn or next turn. Uh, he's at the very least going to be able to complete the first uh, tick of the quest with ease uh, and then follow up with uh, drawing that card and hoping it solves some of his problems. Most for the Phoenix instead, I suppose, for mana efficiency. Mm. If you play Thalnos here, you do have to use the coin to immediately kill it. And if you leave it on board, Tiz could very happily hero power it away and remove your target. So I do kind of get the theory behind the Phoenix pick, but I thought it was going to come down this turn. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if he's setting it up for some big combo turn. Like, you play it the turn before you're going to play Varden, play Varden, and then have a mega pop-off turn with, like, plus five spell damage later on. Yeah, it seems pretty optimistic, doesn't it? Yeah, the way that he's pointed out now, deliberately trying to play it on turn three means that it wakes up into a potential alignment turn, which is cute, but I don't even know if, like... Like, a one-mana fireball yeah. is the most burst he gets, possibly, from the Phoenix. That's not really doing that much into an alignment turn, I think. Yeah, I hadn't considered that. It's quite a, a cute play. Uh, but now for Tiz, he's got, again, that second type of Druid hand that I was talking about, where you don't have Celestial, but you don't really need it either. You can just go with Ramp, Ramp, gain some armor here, absolutely, and then Solar, solar Scenarian into Scenarian kind of just wins the game. If you don't get really bad 8-drops, you have way too much health, way too much pressure on board. Mage is really going to struggle to react. Um, like, okay, what's a an average 8-drop? I honestly don't know. 
let's say you get big stats, no additional effects. Because is yeah. still okay with that, right? He has flurry, he has freeze effects. In fact, those are just minions on board that help him to progress the quest. I don't think the Solar Scenario into Scenarian gets there on its own, even as three eight drops. Uh, if they're all like Tyrians or Alakirs, maybe with that amount of burst. Um, Coil Fang Warlord, yeah. also pretty good. Just anything that's sticky, right? But vanilla eight drops might not cut it. I guess, yeah. I mean, th the problem is that freezing as mage is obviously a delay tactic, but it allows you to just freeze and then burn your opponent down. After they've gained, like, 24 extra armor, you can't just indefinitely freeze. At some point, you're going to have to actually clear those minions lest they just burst you down. Uh, and I think that's maybe where Possessi will start to struggle, unless he can go Varden, survive for a turn, and then hit, like, six damage fire sale. Maybe that will be enough. Um, but I think the delay plan at the moment for Possessi is not quite going to cut it. And we can also see Tiz really doesn't have any other option. There is of no alignment in hand. So that means he doesn't have the option of delaying the Varden, which is terrible. I mean, that was the main point of playing this deck and playing alignment is to make sure that Possessi cannot get his quest rewards done all that quickly. Um, if Possessi had the option to end with Varden in hand, he absolutely would because that does play around alignment, getting the Varden itself down to one, but that won't be available. So it is just going to go for the plan B of getting the two eight drops, hoping for big money here. Okay, okay. Troublemaker's great. This makes yep. Flurry quite bad. One of the better ones, as you said, Flurry, a lot worse, a lot of damage. It's no Taint Heart Tormentor is the absolute nuts True. first mage, uh, <laughs> but you're going to take it very happily here uh, to go for a lot of damage in the next few turns. Well, uh, I confess I didn't quite catch which two spell schools are missing for Possessi, but I'm going to guess it's going to be Frost and Fire because he is going to get the Varden down this turn. <laughs> Maker Unfrozen. Okay, I guess that's fine. Uh, actually, no, he doesn't have mana, right? So it's actually pretty bad that he just has to tank the six damage here. Yeah, no barrier intact. Mm. Yeah, you Time to just dump the Anaconda on board as well. Yeah, that's oh, an survival! Idea. Oh my god, that's nutty! You go survival trade to get rid of the Vard, and yeah, and then more three threes come down. That was uh -huh. pretty insane. <laughs> Possessy back out of focus, nearly falling out of his chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a problem. These are not vanilla eight drops, and that is a very, very powerful <laughs> discover option. Yeah, these do represent some amount of pressure. Uh, you can go for draw, but then again, there's no... Uh, Encanter's Flow played, so even if you were to hit Fire Sail here, it's still only clearing off half the board. You're left with 17 attacks still in play. App Freeze helps delay. Rick yeah. game never going off. Ring Toss, very expensive to corrupt, so it's just going to be the Snap Freeze here. Question is, do you go Flurry, Snap Freeze? Or you can Brain Freeze a 3-3 three -three to make the Flurry certainly hit a target you want to snap freeze. Oi, oi, oi. Yeah, the name of the game here is just absolutely delay, delay, delay. I just don't know about the order. Why not brain freeze first? Then the flurry always freezes a big minion. Right, yeah. Not necessarily the tendon, but okay, this alignment, not necessary. Hmm. Is it? Well... Hold on. Like, so I'm, his hand doesn't synergize with alignment very well at the moment. Well, you do have the play of going what? Anaconda Bloom Bloom Alignment Scenarian Ward on the same turn, uh, which at the very least denies your opponent any of their mana, and I think you just win on the following turn. But it also denies your mana because you bloomed. It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Um, Job done. I mean, I... I'm not sure if it was still worth it just to deny them any counterplay whatsoever. I mean, th this still does it. It just puts a lot less pressure on the board and doesn't set up lethal on the following turn. It doesn't, and I guess it's a bit scary if there's Fire Sail. Fire Sail will still leave a 7 right. on the board, but like, it's not that Mage can do nothing with one mana. And Possessi does end up getting an 8-8. That's not bad, uh, but he's certainly behind here. 
Uh, he is uh, 17, 18 damage available with uh, uh, the Feral Rage and all the blooms that you have to get a hero power in as well, I believe. Yeah, he really doesn't need to... I guess one bloom is fine. He can go like... As long as he fits in the Maw and the 8-8 eight, eight and plays a Scenarian Ward, I'm fine with it. And that means you might as well get the Anaconda online because that'll make the bloom and the Scenarian Ward cost nothing. Yeah, the Anaconda's big as well. <laughs> like, it just represents so much pressure. Oh, the Moog Your heart out, claw machine. Well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. Actually, so true. <laughs> Yeah, that's going to be a lock. Fire Sail does nothing against this board. It was a roundabout way, but it got there. Time waits for no one. I mistake to say the hand doesn't synergize with alignment. Every hand synergizes with alignment <laughs> when you've got Anaconda. Indeed, Possessi thinking incredibly hard there, as we can see from all his pixels, and uh, Tiz is going to be getting us to game five now. Mage lost twice now for Possessi. He instantly got the win with both his Warlock and his Demon Hunter, and speaking of the Demon Hunter, that is all Tiz needs to do to get the win in this series. Now, OTK Demon Hunter versus Spell Mage, a matchup where there's clearly quite a lot of counterplay, right? Because both decks, uh, in a way, have uh, a burst plan, a combo game plan, obviously. Both decks, in a way, have quite a lot of healing to be able to get themselves back up out of range. Obviously, much more so for the Demon Hunter, but still the Bread Baker and the Ice Barriers can be pretty big for the Mage. So with all that kind of apparent symmetry, uh, what do you think breaks the matchup open? Is there a clear favorite in the Mage versus OTK Demon Hunter? Fess, I haven't played too much of it, but I'd have to assume that the mage is in the lead because their quest should get done a lot earlier. Or I guess not necessarily earlier, but the thing is with Demon Hunter, after they get the quest done, they still have to draw quite a couple cards, maybe even glide back the original hand to have their OTK together. And because the mage can heal and the board based damage is pretty much doing nothing in the face of Ice Barrier for the Demon Hunter, um, they probably do have to accrue the 36. Um, being generous 24 sometimes all at once and that uh at that point the bread baker is not really part of the discussion right because the mage is going from full to zero if they are losing the matchup um it does have uh quite a difference with mage versus demon hunter i mean from the mage perspective right because the yeah. mage can't deal 30 to zero a lot of the time which leaves tis a window to heal up but the healing is expensive right the big healing comes in the form of fell scream blast and moard which are combo pieces, and there won't be minions on the other side to target. So I still think it comes out slightly in the mage's favor, but who knows, Tiz is also um, rocking the Glide one of Copy that could be mm. very, very disruptive depending on whether or not Possessi is forced to have a turn where he ends with the Dawn Grasp in hand. That's a good point, yeah. You have to be very careful about when you uh, complete and try to play it on the same turn. Um, while we have a couple of relatively easy turns, I want to get your opinion about Tiz keeping acrobatics in the mulligan, because I've seen a lot of debate uh, in the the practice groups that I'm in and the, the players that I'm talking to about like which cards are good enough to keep as Demon Hunter, because there's the obvious ones like Tusk, Piercer, and Sigil. Uh, but acrobatics specifically, like it draws two cards. It gets you towards that quest completion, but it's pretty expensive. You need something to go alongside it in order to be able to actually complete that first layer of quest. Yeah, I I think on coin it's a little bit more reasonable because on mm. turn three you will generally be able to like play the acro and coin a tradable or maybe you had a sigil played on turn two you can then keep acro on uh if you have the sigil in your starting hand i think uh on coin it's a little bit more easy to maneuver but i will say this is like less of a greedy keep from Tiz. He's just trying to make sure that the quest will get done ASAP and he can get the first proc done here with the Persistent Peddler. Next turn though, it's kind of a question as to whether he will get um, second quest completion because he needs to drop five now. That was a little weird to me that he didn't start with Crimson Sigil Runner. Um, obviously it goes down to zero and he can theoretically get it down to the left-hand side of his hand, but he has to chew through a philosophy on the way, which is, I don't know, kind of easier said than done. If you start Runner, you don't have the mana up to play Acro, right? He could have coined it. He, he still coined a... 
the oh, mana out, the right? Oh, you mean. Yeah. yeah, okay. Fair enough. Okay, philosophy. Sure. Who needs it? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> it's only a one-up in the deck, so you brought up a very good point that that's kind of an expensive card to Yeah. Play. This runner, I feel, needs to get played because it's not realistically going to be outcast for a long time with the Moargs. Yeah, it's just... Oof. <gasps> It's just an awkward hand all around here, just unable to complete the quest efficiently. Uh, obviously, I like that he's killing off his own minion here at the end. And, oh, okay, that's actually fair enough. I guess that's probably why he didn't want to go with the runner last turn is because he is against Mage, and he does want to deny quest completion. Um, yeah. So, fair enough, actually. Uh, I think that's probably a reasonable line then. Except that Possessi doesn't have any Frost spells to begin with. That is such an awkward problem to have. Thinking about ping over the ignite because he's already committed a fireball for the for the quest completion and he doesn't want ignites at the deck this early. He wants ice barrier. He wants brain freeze because he has one thief. Ooh, that looks like the kind of card we're looking for. This hand we were talking about, the awkwardness, not wanting to play minions without killing them off, having card draw that doesn't quite fit in your mana cost, outcast cards that can't be outcast. Let's get rid of all of that. Let's just try again uh, with this hand and it looks. Uh, pretty reasonable. A sigil to start things off. Double jump Illidari studies puts him in a reasonable spot to be able to complete the quest next turn as well. Yeah, put the Ilganoth back in so it's not really blocking anything. Uh, with all these zero-cost spells, I think it's almost certainly that Tiz is going to be able to get Kurtris in hand. But for Possessi, doesn't end up with barrier still. He gets a flow, decent, but man, there's so little card draw. Oh, big discount, too. Okay, okay. The combo, of course, is, as you were saying, very important in this matchup. It's not quite possible to just heal out of range of all their burn with uh, Ignites eternally shuffling back and forth. Uh, so two cards now drawn already, right? Crimson Sigil Runner plus Double Jump. Oh. Does not guarantee you the ability to complete the quest, but that was still a very quick Double Jump instead of the Sigil Runner. Yeah, I think starting with the runner first was my first instinct there. Unless Tiz knew that his only uh, outcast cards left were card draw. I'm not necessarily sure. I'm pretty sure there's at least one I-beam in there. So risky, risky. Paid off, though, of course, because he now gets to play Kurtris on this turn, which is a monumental difference. Uh, I think... In all honesty, like, I've kind of just been a step behind Tiz this game this whole time. Like, all the things he's been considering, it's uh, very on point. Like, keeping the acrobatics again, I'm kind of unsure of. Uh, but his play so far throughout the game has been very on point, I think. The slight downside, though, to using Acro to complete the quest is it's your best card draw engine post-quest gone. Yeah. Uh, because post-quest, Acro very often draws you four for the cost of one. Um, We'll see later if Tiz is able to get to what he needs, though, because he's still Ilganoth um, and Felstream Blast away, and I guess a Philosophy or an additional Moarg. Okay, Possessi able to go through two thirds of Quest 2 right now, missing second Frostbow. Mm. Yeah, it's so brutal. He's just wasting so many arcane spells here and probably will end up wasting fire spells as well, not really progressing his quest. Sigil runners also are stuck in a very awkward position. He does not want to dump the Morg and the Talented Arcanist. But all he needs now is Ilganoth, honestly. When it comes into hand, it's four mana. So I guess turn nine, as long as he has Ilganoth in hand, he has the, the 36. Wow, is he making wow. room to draw? Yeah, I think so. That means Tiz is very confident that he has enough combo pieces left to do this. Wow. Clearing off your entire board still to stop them from completing quest? Like, is this a good read to make? You're, like, you left a minion on board last turn, right? And they didn't turbo through their quest on it? They I surely mean, would have abused that harder if they could. I don't necessarily know if it's a read. I th uh, sorry, wrong highlight. Um, <laughs> it's really just about whether Tiz is able to actually get right. to his combo pieces and whether there's enough of them. Mm. So we have to look at what's remaining, right? He still has one Moarg. 
and the guild trader, which will probably cost zero by the time it comes back, and then talent yeah. arcanist, which is 30. So he can get the combo as long Not as it. he sees the bottom of his deck. So this entire play is just committing to making sure he can outcast the sigil runners, which in that case, I'm fine with it. Yeah, he's still got the, the lack of acros is really big, isn't it? Yeah, it's really hampering him here. Because uh, again, you need these Crimson Sigil Runners to chain into more card draw realistically. And like Peddler, Pleasure it's kind of card draw, but it just shuffles a Peddler back into your deck, which makes things further harder. Uh, Ilganoth for four mana. We're starting to get there once again. The combo piece is starting to fill up the hand again. There's the acrobatics that we've been looking for. Yeah, that one is huge. Always draws four. Always. Ooh. Oh, he always draws six. <laughs> This is just a million. Like, he has to have lethal next turn, right? Yep. I think so, at least. Guild Trader being in there for the redundancy is enormous. There's the Arcanist. Doesn't technically need it, but sure. That's more, more card draw, <laughs> more, more, more. Pleasure doing business. Yeah. Back in the deck, there's the Moarg. Okay, he has an extra, even without the Guild Trader. Thinking about counter spell, you can just start with I Beam uh, as long as there's a minion on board, so that's not a concern. And you can guarantee draw a zero mana minion uh, to shoot with it with the uh, uh, swing of the weapon into Peddler. So I realistically don't see any way that Possessi isn't dead next turn. Look at all these runners. Just pretty. <laughs> cool. No brutes to protect them this time. Yeah. And yeah, I think Possessi knows it. There's very little counterplay from this point, even if you do hit the counter spell. Like you said, Tiz has that I beam, plenty of mana to work with, and the power of the Turbo Kurtris is once again proving me wrong that the mage is relatively slow when they don't have access to targets to hit with the frost spells. Oh man, yeah, even like even in this matchup, turn nine feels slow. Like that was a, a bit of a rough hand for Possessi in the mid game, especially with the glide hitting him, taking away all of his ability Whoa. to actually, uh, you know, progress his quest. Uh, but here Perhaps now, him up here. it's I'd a billion. <laughs> it's gotta be a billion, right? <laughs> uh, close, close. I got it all. That's four spell damage. I yeah. Like I said. That felt like lo it felt like it should have been more, but I guess without third Moarg, it doesn't really get into the triple digit range. Not quite. Uh, Possessi giving us a big old wave there. Unfortunately for him, that is the end of the run, but I'm, as he well knows, at 13 points already after just three weeks, he is in a pretty unassailable spot at the top of the leaderboard for the moment. But Tiz, this is what we want to see. Things turning around for our boy who has had a decidedly, uh, you know, meh, not particularly great start going 0-2 in the first week, getting through to the quarterfinals in the second week. First semi-final of the season, or first final, sorry, now of the season, now that he's won his semi finals uh, puts him in a much better position to break away from the pack at the bottom the likes of Alan Glory Chonsu and Blitzchung uh, it's a big win for Tiz yeah and the lineup is looking very good if yeah. just face off against Okashinsuke in the final because who knows True. Alutamu has the very heavy aggro lineup which is going to eat um, Tiz's druid for breakfast Okashinsuke feeling probably decently favored versus Alutamu because it was the shaman that did end up getting banned the handlock still has a decent matchup versus aggro and so does the OTK demon hunter but if Alutamu manages to pull out the unfavorable then suddenly Tiz is looking a little bit scared Oh, dear, like, I like Tiz. I, I like the way he <laughs> plays the game. But a man who roots against Alu Temu, I, I, I can't be on board with that. I cannot sanction this <laughs> behavior as a, a diehard Alu Temu fan. Uh, but yes, uh, as you correctly put, it's going to be a much, much worse matchup for Tiz uh, against Alu Temu. 